The strong NASA presence at this year's symposium is clearly represented in our next panel, where we have gathered six center directors who are leading NASA in a time of transition. And to lead the discussion, we welcome Dr. David Livingston, the founder and host of The Space Show. Dr. Livingston, we look forward to your panel. Thank you very much, and um, thank you also to the Space Foundation for making this discussion possible. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to introduce our panel members today uh, for the center director's discussion in a time of transition. So on my far right is uh, Dr. Ellen Ochoa, and she is the director of the Johnson Space Center. And sitting next to her is Dr. Janet Cavandi, and she is the director of Glenn. Uh, Dr. Mike Watkins is JPL, right here. Uh, we also welcome Dr. Crystal Johnson, and she is the Deputy Center Director of Technology and Research Investments at Goddard. Todd May is at Marshall, and Dr. Robert, and Robert Cabana from Kennedy Space Center. We will have an opening statement of about five minutes from each one about transition with their center, and then we will take your questions um, for the panel, so feel free to direct them directly to a panel member or to a center or multiple centers if you want. Please be succinct because we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A and we want to be on time. So Dr. Ochoa, please. All right, well thank you. Well, since I'm the one starting out, I'm going to make a few comments that I think really apply maybe more broadly uh, across all of the NASA centers. Uh, give some examples, though, that apply directly to Johnson Space Center uh, as well, and then uh, really let all of the other center directors talk about some of the specific work going on at their centers. And the slides that are showing, we're, I'm just going to scroll through, and they're just examples of things um, that are going on at Johnson Space Center through the International Space Station Program, Orion, and some of the other work that we do. So the first point I wanted to make is that I feel we're in a really good position to deal with transition because NASA operates in a much more integrated fashion than we have previously. And the centers are really collaborating with and depending on capabilities at other centers. And this is actually something we've been working on for a few years uh, under the leadership of our now acting administrator, Robert Lightfoot and Lisa Rowe, to really uh, ensure that we're using all of the expertise and capabilities that we have across the center. Um, and that looks at facilities, it looks at workforce, and, and how we can use all of those. One example is we are building a new human health and performance laboratory at JSC, which will open later this year, which focuses on our prime responsibility in that area. When it's built, we'll be able to demolish seven other buildings. And we also have another, a lot of other buildings that are slated for demolition, including a, a vibration and acoustic test facility, because we have facilities like that at other centers. Uh, we have the responsibility for Orion at Johnson Space Center, uh, but Glenn works closely with us as they're managing the European space, uh, service module for that mission. And with Orion, SLS, Rocket, and the ground systems, those are three programs at three different centers, but Todd, Bob, and I all know that we're going to succeed as a team. And that's a message that we talk to, to our workforce and to our stakeholders, including congressional members, that we all need to be succeeding. We work with JPL in a number of areas, exploration architectures and activities, science operations with curiosity as we have some sample scientists at JSC, and mission operations tool and processes. Uh, one of our folks leads a mission operations capability team across the agency looking at sharing tools and processes, and JPL is certainly one of the big players in that. And even with Goddard, even though Goddard is not um, a, a center that we have had a lot of collaboration with in the past, we're very excited that at Johnson Space Center, we're going to be getting the James Webb Space Telescope in another month or so for testing in all th our thermal vac chamber. And about the same time that that's going on, Goddard is going to be using an acoustic chamber they have to test the Boeing Starliner crew module which of course is for the commercial crew program, which Kennedy Space Center and I and our center work together to manage. So those are just some of the examples of how we're collaborating. Another point is that we expect a continued focus on the commercialization of low Earth orbit. 
and we are all looking to that and working toward that. And at Johnson Space Center, that takes the form a lot of, of what ISS, the International Space Station Program, is doing on maximizing utilization for both commercial and NASA partners and increasing the use of commercial services. The ISS program and Johnson Space Center, we both work to streamline processes so that we can get payload hardware developed and ready to send to ISS in a shorter time frame and more affordably for the people developing it. And of course, CASIS works with our non-NASA customers to get payloads there. Um, ISS is also evolving toward more commercialization of services. So in addition to commercial resupply services and the commercial crew program, they have a, a contract which is in the, the final stages right now called REMIS, Research Engineering and Mission Integration Services, which will enable private industry and organizations to develop capabilities so that they can provide spaceflight hardware, software, and mission integration and operations services on a commercial basis for the International Space Station. Just a couple examples there for that increasing look at commercialization. Another point is that NASA's deep space exploration plans are really focused on the attributes of what a national space agency should be providing. They look to global leadership and engagement, for example, and we have leveraged ISS relationships with our international partners to engage the European Space Agency in Orion, for example. Um, they look to national security and economic benefits, and just one example of that is really the hundreds of suppliers that Orion and SLS use um, all across the country, including many small businesses that are capable of providing aerospace grade parts for these, which is useful not only for the aerospace industry, but for other industries and really keeps that manufacturing base in the country. Almost everything that we do at NASA is also about expanding scientific knowledge, which benefits uh, the public. And it also continues to be about inspiration. And, and we were gratified by the huge public response to the Exploration Flight Test 1 of Orion a couple of years ago and look forward to fur uh, further Journey to Mars activities. Thank you. Dr. Kavandi. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm at the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. We have two different uh, locations there. Uh, we are at the airport, the Hopkins International Airport in Cleveland, and as well at Sandusky, which is about 50 miles west. So we are not JPL. We are. Uh, <laughs> the, we will need a different set of the videos if you if you can pull that up. We have a video that will show the Glenn operations. Um, but just to get started here, we are about half aeronautics and about half space at our center. But I'll just focus on the space side here today. So with Orion and the SLS, we don't build SLS, but do, we do contribute in that we are um, helping to lead the procurement of the Universal Stage Adapter, which is the adapter that goes between the EUS and the Orion. We are also responsible, as Ellen said, for the service module, which is actually being built uh, through the European Space Agency, uh, and it's being built in uh, Bremen at the Airbus facility there. So you can see that the service module is located underneath the crew module and contains the solar arrays and propulsion capability for, that, for the upper stage there. The space power facility is at the Sandusky facility out there. I mentioned earlier, it's got a reverberant acoustics facility that's the most capable, powerful in the world. Uh, we also have the world's largest vacuum chamber. It's 100 feet in diameter and about 122 feet tall. It goes completely to vacuum, can test full-scale fairings in there. We also have the most powerful vibration table. A sinusoidal vibration table can hold up to about 79,000 pounds on that table. After the vibration and all the environmental testings for the service module test article, we were able to deploy the arrays successfully there this past year. We spent about an entire year doing all those environmental testings out, out there the, uh, over the last 12 months or so. Again, we've tested not only the fairings full scale for our own equipment, but we're also doing for commercial vendors as well. We also have a B2 test facility out at Plumbrook Station. This is a, an environmental chamber that can go to vacuum. Uh, it can test in cold and hot. Uh, simulated environments. We recently tested Morpheus, which is built at Johnson Space Center. It was an ability to test this vehicle 
under flight conditions. So we're, you can see the reaction control jets firing there. And then we also tested the, the main engine uh, in the facility there as well. So a lot of good information uh, obtained from that test as well as recertifying that facility for future use. In addition to the vacuum chamber I just mentioned, we also have other vacuum chambers that are used more for electric propulsion tests. So we can do many thousands of hours of testing in these other vacuum chambers that we have at the uh, facility at the Lewis Field there at the airport. And Ellis also mentioned that we have capability leadership within the different centers. NASA Glenn is responsible for electric propulsion for the agency. So we, we are the lead, but we also work with JPL and Goddard, who also have a lot of capability in those areas. And we just ensure that we're not duplicating efforts uh, at the different facilities. So we are um, the lead for that. Of course, this kind of uh, technology has been used for deep space applications, as well as the new gateway um, proposals for, for future NASA missions. We also had a lead in a lot of the solar electric um, uh, development, uh, the, the actual solar arrays, and combined with electric propulsion. Space communication is another major uh, area at the Glenn Research Center. We have the scan test bed, which is currently operating on the International Space Station. This uses software to find radios to maximize the benefit of the different uh, orbits, uh, the different uh, communication satellites in orbit around the Earth as well as laser optical based communication. So we have a test bed there at the research facility. And of course, you know, pointing is a, is a key component of laser base. We have a great capability to increase uh, the amount of data that flows, but pointing is key to that. Also in the International Space Station, we have several different uh, facilities. We have a combustion integrated rack. We're able to test uh, flames in space. We also have Sapphire, which is a larger scale flames experiment, as well as fluids research that's conducted on station, which of course the wicking properties are essential to ensuring that the engines uh, ignite properly. We also do a lot of research on human performance and exercise equipment, not only for the space station, but also for future exploration capabilities, how to get a maximum uh, exercise out of a very small volume. Uh, this harness was developed so that we could run, uh, the astronauts could run on the International Space Station on the treadmill up there. So this, the stars in there just show that the Glenn Research uh, community is all, all the way from the Earth on the Earth orbit all the way to eventually getting us to Mars and everywhere in between. So that's a brief summary of Glenn, and I'll pass it off to the next. Th thank you. Uh, Dr. Watkins. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to turn the conversation a little bit toward the Science Mission Directorate, which is really where JPL does the bulk of our, of our work, and then I think Crystal will continue that discussion, particularly in the Earth Science area. Um, I think there's been a little change in the character of, of solar system exploration here uh, in this decade. And I think, you know, there was a time where we spent the last 20 years trying to understand what does our solar system look like, and, and what do all the planets and the small bodies, um, you know, what do they look like, what do they consist of, what are they telling us about the, the origin of the solar system. And I think now that we've kind of done that first pass through all the planets, what we now want to do is go to the ones that we think are the most interesting. And I think you now see kind of an integrated concept flowing through a lot of SMD missions, and that's really the search for life and the search for habitable uh, areas both in our solar system and then even, even exoplanets as I'll, as I'll talk about later. And I think most folks know that that kind of started with what we thought was the most habitable planet, the habitable zone in this Goldilocks area that, uh, you know, that, that Venus, the Earth, and Mars are theoretically in. And so the Mars Exploration Program has always been, I think, part of the foundation of, of the search for habitable areas and, and life. And of course, we've been doing this very intensively for 10 or 15 years now with a number of successful missions both orbiters and, uh, and landers. And those landers, of course, have grown in capability to where we can now carry analytical chemistry labs with us, and we can survey the history of Mars very, very accurately. And of course, upcoming missions are even looking at taking samples that could someday be returned. And this experience happens to be not only good for, for science and for the search for life, but also tells us really some of the, the precursors of, of, of how to send humans to Mars. And so this we're very closely with, with the Johnson Space Center and, and, and other parts of NASA to understand, you know, how do you really operate on Mars? How do you land on Mars? How do you do these telepresence uh, operations with long delays that, you know, that we don't typically have in, in low Earth? So I think the experience we're gaining on Mars both is valuable scientifically, but also valuable for the, for the human exploration program. And I think most folks know we have InSight launching uh, next year, and then we have the Mars 2020 rover, which is a follow-on to the, to the Curiosity rover, and we'll not only do 
fantastic search for organics uh, on the surface, but we'll actually grab some samples and, and keep them on the surface in case we can get them back uh, uh, in, in another mission in the next few years. Uh, now, the, the interesting new development, really since, since I was in graduate school even, uh, is this notion that, that that habitable zone where the Earth and Mars is, is not the only habitable zone in the solar system. And I think this has been a real scientific breakthrough and a scientific change. What we now realize is that there is tons and tons of water in the, in the outer solar system that we didn't really know. And particularly in these moons of, of Jupiter and Saturn, there's enough tidal cycling, enough tidal friction that, that you see enormous oceans. And so in case of Europa, you have an ocean that's larger than the Earth uh, under the ice. And I think folks now see that these are prime targets. They're maybe even better targets than Mars uh, if you want to look for habitable environments and, and possibly even signs of life. And so what that brings up is a discussion, I think, between scientists of what's really the, what's really the best place to go. And folks have their own favorite targets. Some people still think Mars is the best target. Uh, some folks think Titan is the best target. Some folks think Europa is the best target, which where it looks, I think, to most people right now like the best one, but many people vote for Titan, vote for Enceladus, where we've seen the geysers uh, on the surface. Each one has a fascinating set of conditions that make it a very prime candidate for, for a habitable environment and for life. And so that's both the thermal environment as well as interactions between water and ice and water and, and silicate materials at the, at the bottom of the ocean. And of course, there could even potentially be, particularly for the larger bodies, uh, hydrothermal systems at the bottom, ge geothermal systems at the bottom, which are one of the areas <coughs> where life could have originated on the Earth. So what we've now seen is there's not one or two places in the, Earth, in the solar system we can look for life, there's, there's 10 places. And we need to develop an integrated program for how can we explore these places, and some of them are new types of exploration, unlike Mars, that we're still learning how to do. A Europa Clipper, for example, is I think really the first stage in understanding these, these ocean worlds, but there are some other candidate missions that, um, that SMB is looking at for, um, for other types of exploration of, of Titan and Enceladus, for example. Now, in a strange coincidence, uh, I, I often joke that we're finding other Earth-like planets that could possibly be habitable at, at almost the same rate we're finding them inside the solar system. So there's kind of a race between where we're gonna find the best place for life. It could be outside the solar system. You know, we found 3,000 exoplanets, and I think most of us up here, it wasn't too long ago when there were no exoplanets found. And now there's 3,500, and we're finding them at, at, a, at, a, at a furious pace, and we're finding not only giant Jupiters, and gas giants, but we're finding Earth-like planets and super-Earths and places that look like they could um, be the kind of place where, where life could exist. Um, we're very close technologically to being able to do uh, spectroscopy on the starlight passing through the, the potential atmosphere of these planets. And when we do that, that's a great opportunity to find perhaps an oxygen-rich or even a water-rich world out there somewhere. And I think there is a good chance we'll find such a world uh, as quickly as we will be able to explore some of these ocean worlds in the outer solar system. So it's just, it's just a phenomenal time, I think, to, you know, to, to be in this field and to be looking for, um, for, the, for the future of, 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 um, of, of exploration for, uh, for life. There is one planet where we're pretty sure there is life. Uh, that's the Earth. We do a fair amount of work uh, at JPL uh, using <laughs> planetary-derived sensors to, you know, to understand the Earth in a, in a broad range of of uh, spectral ranges, uh, you know, every, everything from gravity to, you know, to, to, to altimetry and radar and, and, and many others. And uh, this continues to be a robust field. You know, we do a tremendous amount of work that's applicable to places like the California drought, for example, or California snowpack, uh, you know, out, out where we live in California, uh, but also to, uh, to many other regions and, and, and to the world as a whole. And I think this is a good segue to, uh, to turn it over to Crystal, who's uh, our, our big partner in, uh, in Earth Science at, uh, at Goddard. Thank you. And doctor, go ahead, please. Okay, so at Goddard, we strive to we strive to do several things every single day. But we strive to be a premier science organization. We're one of the few organizations that has complete end-to-end -end capability. That's all the way from coming up with a concept in your mind to developing a prototype, then being able to do actual flight hardware, then launching it with our Wallops flight facility capabilities, and then being able to take that da data, get it back down to Earth, and transform that data into something that can be applied to real-world applications where you're making a difference in everyday life. We also strive, we have a t about 10,000 employees and as a part of the Goddard family, and that's including civil servants and contractors. The largest gathering of both scientists and engineers co-located in one site so that we can do very, very innovative approaches to science. 
Um, in addition to that, we have amazing facilities at Goddard. So a combination of the end-to-end -end capability, the strength in our science and engineering core, and the facilities enable to do us some of the most complex missions, science missions, for our agency. We also strive to enable exploration. So the science missions that we come up with, in addition to our COM and NAV capability, enable us to better understand the universe and to explore deeper into it. We also strive to improve lives and protect the nation. We have a very strong relationship with NOAA and have helped to develop and launch all of the, the domestic weather sites, satellites that we've got going on out there. Uh, in addition to that, the technologies that we're developing today help us to even do a better job in predicting extreme weather events, spread of waterborne diseases and crop yields and so many other things that help us to inform the national security objectives. Then also, we strive to invest in America. Goddard, Goddard is committed to strengthening the U.S. economy, and as we see these new technologies, we provide business opportunities, and especially for some of the smaller businesses within the United States. And we also, while we're doing that, inspire the next generation of innovators and engineers. And this video that you're gonna see here has just a little, actually if you could, start the video here. We've had over 300 successful flight missions at our center. And this gives a, a couple of examples here. MAVEN taking a look at what happened with the Martian atmosphere. This is MMS, magnetospheric. And then here we are with LRO, which is mapping the lunar surface. In addition to that, <clears throat> We've got search and rescue activities. We've been developing search and technology, uh, search and rescue technologies both nationally and globally to be able to help search and rescue activities around the world for global systems. This is a global precipitation mission. You can see a low, low front coming through, being able to map the rainfall. This is Cannibal, which we're taking technologies and being able to do a virtual telescope, which will help for, for our astrophysics and heliophysics applications. We have a detector characterization lab, detector development and characterization lab, where we're developing a wide range of detector capability. We also have materials development and we have optical component development and, and characterization capabilities where we were actually able to, to build for the CATS mission that's flying on the International Space Station. But one of the biggest assets that we've got at Goddard is our people. And we've, with that 10,000 group here, they are a diverse group of people. Um, you can see from some of these images here, we're able to bring the best ideas from the best people and, and varied backgrounds together to do some of the most challenging missions like James Webb Space Telescope that you just saw there. This last slide that we have here is just kind of giving a couple of examples of some of the elements that we've got in the core lines of business. At Goddard, we operate under lines of business. We have four core ones, that's earth science, astrophysics, heliophysics, and planetary science. And then we've got three supporting lines of business. One of them is communications and navigation, where you see space and near-earth communication networks and the LCRD mission. Then we've got SPARS, which is our suborbital, suborbital platforms and range capabilities, where we run the balloon program, we have our aircraft, a sounding rocket program, and we support Antares launch vehicle out at the Wilds Flight Facility. And the last is cross-cutting technologies, where we develop all kinds of innovative technologies that could be applied to any of our four core science areas. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. May from Marshall. Hey, David. I think we start with a video here while I say a few words. Um, I, I would just say that during this, this time right now, the Marshall Space Flight Center um, men and women are busy little beavers. Uh, we are working with our industry partners across the nation on the space launch system which is the most powerful rocket in history and will take humankind further than we've ever been. Um, we're, we're entering that phase where we're actually uh, pretty hardware rich right now and Ellen and Bob and Janet and I uh, are starting to have a little fun with each other of who's, who's, who's waiting on whose hardware and who's closest <laughs> to the critical path, which is really making it kind of fun because we're all a little bit competitive as well. Um, we also uh, have for 15 years now managed all the payloads on the International Space Station for uh, the Space Station Program Office, and this year they have um, a goal to, to double the amount of research they're doing, and so we're ramping up to be able to handle that work. Uh, recently, with our industry partner, Ball, uh, we competed and won the Ixpeed mission using uh, a unique grazing incident optics uh, technology we have, uh, which will study some of the most powerful uh, phenomenon in the universe, 
and uh, that team is getting up and running, and so they're, they're pretty excited about that. Um, for over 10 years now, we've managed what is now called the Planetary Programs Office, which um, you may recognize some of the, the programs in that, the Discovery Program, the New Frontiers Program, and now the Europa, Europa Program Office, and, uh, which is really exciting time uh, for that, that group as well. Um, we're also working on a number of advanced technology areas, the next generation regenerative life support systems, uh, advanced in-space propulsion, including things like thermal nuclear propulsion, LOX methane, solar sails, and hybrid propulsion. Uh, we also have been uh, really working on uh, advanced composites, uh, including uh, robotic machines to build large out of autoclave structures. Uh, a picture you see here is uh, some, of the, some of the unique hardware we have on uh, SLS today. The, the facility on the left is the vertical assembly center. It's over 200 feet tall, and that's how we uh, weld up the LOX tanks and all the major structures, the hydrogen tank, the inner tank, the forward section on the SLS. Uh, and on the right there, the Pegasus barge that was actually used for the external tank on shuttle and we, we cut it in half and extended it uh, 65 feet. It's now longer than a football field. Uh, and then uh, Bob, of course, reminds us every day he's looking forward to seeing this picture <laughs> when all the pieces show up. Uh, I am pleased to report that the first piece of the rocket, the ICPS, has actually arrived at Kennedy Space Center. So, Bob, you're welcome for that. <laughs> Let's go forward one slide here. Um, so the, 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 the uh, machine on the left there is the one I talked about, the robotic advanced composites uh, machine there. That's uh, one of only three in the country. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, ICSPI, and you see uh, one of the other areas we're really interested in, kind of a niche market in 3D printing of turbo machinery, high nickel alloys. Uh, we've actually built one that uh, spins at 86,000 RPM and put 20,000 pounds of thrust through it. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of industry partnerships um, both uh, traditional and emerging aerospace companies. Uh, we have actually over uh, several hundred uh, various uh, partnerships with industry, with various agencies, with academia. And uh, so our doors are open. We have a lot of capabilities that are unique and that we bring to bear uh, in mutually beneficial partnerships as well. Uh, in terms of uh, SLS today, we have uh, over 1,100 contracts in 43 states. Over 800 of those are small business. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the flight components and the qual components for the core stage are now, all the major pieces are now built. Uh, those will soon be coming on barge. The qual units up to Marshall Space Flight Center for testing. All those test stands are on track. Um, if we had uh, Stennis here today, they would tell you the B stand is, is ready to receive the core stage as well. Uh, the first boosters, uh, the flight boosters are being cast. Uh, the ICPS, as I said, is, uh, the flight one is actually um, um, been delivered to Kennedy Space Center, and uh, the engines are now being fired with the flight controllers. We, we, we've got the new state-of-the-art Honeywell controllers that, uh, that we've actually exercised now on the stand at Stennis. And, uh, and so we're really looking forward to seeing that Pegasus barge moving up and down from Mishu uh, to Huntsville over the next year or so. So, got a lot going on. Bob? Thank you. Bob, go ahead, please. Thanks, David. So the Kennedy Space Center is the poster child for change during a time of transition. <laughs> in, the, in the last six years, we have evolved to be America's premier uh, spaceport. This was KSC six years ago. One government program utilizing all the facilities, paying all the bills. Today, it's a totally different story as we look at Boeing, SpaceX, Blue Origin. In all of history, three nations have sent humans to space, the United States, Russia, and China. Today, there are four United States companies with facilities at the Kennedy Space Center building hardware to send humans to space. If you look at uh, Blue Origin, they're building a huge facility in Exploration Park, a research and development park at the Kennedy Space Center outside the secure perimeter to build the new Glenn rocket. Of course, we've got uh, Boeing. Boeing is located in what used to be Orbiter Processing Facility 3 and also in Orbiter Processing Facilities 1 and 2 with the Air Force X-37 space plane. Of course, Boeing's entry into the commercial crew market is the CST-100 Starliner, and they're doing a bang-up job down there building that. If you move off to SpaceX, now you've got the Crew Dragon, and looking out to what used to, what is Launch Complex 39A, what used to be uh, 
a shuttle and Apollo launch pad. We've now launched three commercial launches with SpaceX off that facility. And that's where the crew is going to launch from on the Crew Dragon. And then rounding it out, of course, we've got Lockheed Martin with the Orion spacecraft being built in the Operations and Checkout Building High Bay. Uh, partnership with the state of Florida refurbishing that to accommodate Lockheed Martin in there. Then we look at the ground systems and development operations program at the Kennedy Space Center, building the infrastructure to support the space launch system. Uh, it, tremendous progress has been made. You know, if you look at SLS and what we're doing, you know, six years ago inside the vehicle assembly building, we had the shuttle. Today, if you look inside High Bay 3, there are 10 adjustable platforms that support this rocket as it evolves, easily adjustable with inserts as it grows and the outer mold line changes. Uh, all those platforms are installed. It's complete. You know, the mobile launcher, a mobile launch platform that supported shuttle. Today, we have a mobile launch launcher supporting SLS and a clean pad design. Uh, it, here you can see, uh, the first umbilical being installed. All the structural work is complete. All the systems are going into it now. This will be complete in September of this year. The high bay will be complete in April of this uh, year at the end of the month. Uh, with still some outfitting to do in the launch pad. If you look out to the launch pad, uh, it's going to be complete in August. Uh, we're completing the flame trench right now with all the fire brick and the new flame deflector. Uh, we are going to be ready when SLS arrives. Uh, Todd, I tell uh, my program manager, Mike Bulger, without undue pressure, KSC will not be the reason that we don't launch on time. <laughs> Ellen? <laughs> you know, if, if you look at the Kennedy Space Center, five years ago we had a vision, and uh, we've made that vision a reality. Public-private partnerships work. We have transformed KSC, and it's not government programs or commercial programs. If we are going to be successful, it's government and commercial. We need them both. They're fully integrated for us to be successful as a nation, and uh, Kennedy is ready to support this future, and I think it's an absolutely outstanding one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions, so if you do have additional questions, please do send them in. Uh, so, Dr. Ochoa, this one is for you. What is your definition of public-private partnerships, and how is JSC going to appreciate and appro approach their use? Well, I don't think there's just one definition. I think what we found at NASA over the last few years is there's a variety of different ways that we can interact with companies and organizations. So at Johnson Space Center, and, and this will be true across the board, we have contracts. Um, but those contracts are changing as well, well th where they're moving um, less in terms of cost plus contracts and more in terms of fixed price and milestone based contracts. We have Space Act agreements, we have reimbursable Space Act agreements and non-reimbursable Space Act agreements. We have SBIRs where we support small business and we're particularly looking for technology that we know fits in our deep, deep space exploration plans. And so we're trying to look at a variety of mechanisms. And I think across NASA, we're trying to be very open-minded about the different ways that we can interact with different organizations. And as you look at the variety uh, of companies that are here, um, almost all of them we have relationships with and, and in, are using one of those mechanisms to work. So we feel like we're partnering with, with almost everybody that we see here. Thank you. Uh, this is more of a general question, so any of you can respond or more than one of you can respond. The theme of this symposium seems to be international cooperation everywhere. What steps is NASA taking to achieve that, not just with the space station partners, but the rest of the world? So does anyone want to take a stab at that? Well, I'll mention a couple things okay. and other people may want to chime in. I did want to mention, you know, the, the space station obviously has been a partnership of five space agencies representing 15 countries. But to date, we've actually involved 95 countries somehow in the International Space Station program through science experiments or education activities. So it goes well beyond the programs that we originally had. And then, as I mentioned, and, and um, of course, Glenn is working with us on this. We've already engaged the European Space Agency in Orion, 
And um, if you've heard Bill Gerstenmeier talk about the deep space gateway, what we're really looking is for is infrastructure in the lunar vicinity that again can support a variety of international partner interests as well as commercial interests. Anybody else want to comment? I might add one thing from yeah. the science perspective. Uh, the vast majority of Earth science and planetary science missions are in fact joint with, no. uh, with an international partner. It's, okay. it's, often, it's often the European Space Agency. Many times it's bilateral, for example, with CNES or DLR. Uh, we're seeing more now Japanese Space Agency and many others. Uh, uh, JPL has a very significant mission with, uh, with India called the NASA India uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission. So I, I think effectively every single planetary mission has at least instruments or components that are, that are contributed by, uh, by international partners and we, and we think that that's critical to the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, for Bob Cabana, SpaceX recently launched a commercial mission off of LC-39A utilizing flight safety systems. As commercial companies continue to innovate and grow, how will the role of the agency in supporting commercial launches change? So the role of the agency supporting commercial launches is not going to change. We fully support commercial launches. And uh, one of the things that we've done is work very closely with the Air Force and the FAA to make commercial launches from the Cape uh, more user friendly, uh, less costly. Uh, through these agreements, to launch a commercial launch off the Kennedy Space Center, you have to have an FAA launch license, okay? And the criteria for that is the same as uh, safely launching from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And we've worked closely with the 45th Space Wing. Uh, General Monteith also wants to ensure that launches from the Cape side are uh, easier also. He said, if NASA can do it, why can't we? Uh, automated flight termination systems are the future. It's much less costly and, in my opinion, much more reliable. As they uh, prove themselves, uh, you know, this is the future. It's going to be much easier to launch. And, you know, General Monteith wants to get to a, a rate where we launch, you know, 48 flights a year out of the Cape. Um, I think that that is going to happen. There's no reason we can't launch one rocket in the morning and another in the afternoon. It shouldn't take 48 hours to turn the range around with today's technology. And I think you're going to see a continual push to enable uh, commercial operations. Uh, actually, SpaceX has launched three flights now off launch pad 39A, and uh, they've got a lot more coming. So uh, this, is, this is the future, and it's, I think it's a fantastic partnership. We're working very well with our commercial partners. We're working very well with the Air Force and the FAA to make this happen, and it's gonna continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is also a, a general question, uh, so anyone who would like can, can respond to it. There is a lot of talk about renewing our nation's infrastructure. So many of NASA's facilities and infrastructures date to the 1960s or, or earlier. So what are the pressing investments needed to assure NASA can continue to achieve its mission? Or what improvements have you made at your center which we might not be aware of? So does anyone want to take that one I on? Can, I can start out maybe with, uh, okay. with the Glenn Research Center. We're, we just uh, completed our 75th anniversary last year. So we do have a lot of uh, aging facilities and we have been very proactive in trying to uh, do what Ellen was mentioning. We're trying to refurbish some of the ones that are the ones that we need to keep and the ones that we don't need to keep anymore. We're you know, carefully uh, taking those away. We get money that uh, is provided by the, um, you know, the, the the agency itself and we are on a prioritization list on what we can build and what we have to, to get rid of. And we are trying with this capability leadership theme, uh, ensure that we're not duplicating capabilities across the different centers. So we are very careful to, for instance, the, the space power facility out at Plumbrook Station that I showed earlier, that's a very unique capability. We don't want to lose that capability, so we're maintaining and, and restoring that uh, facility as much as possible, but in some of the other areas we're trying to d uh, divest of those. So it's just being smart in what we, we keep up and what we divest of. Thank you. Does anyone else want to address I'll add to that, David. Uh, so we're constantly looking to replace infrastructure at the Kennedy Space Center as it needs to be replaced. Uh, we're only 50 years old, but we've replaced water lines. Uh, we're all fiber optic now, uh, getting rid of copper. Uh, I think one of the neatest projects we've got going is we're building a new headquarters building that's lead gold. And when that building's complete, along with a new data center that we've built that replaces this huge computer facility for old IBM mainframes, we're tearing down three large, old, costly buildings. And 
with the new building, we'll save $6 million a year in operating expenses. The project pays for itself in 10 years and will last many years after that for a huge cost savings. So this is something that we work together very closely with NASA headquarters, how we invest our construction of facilities funds, how we use the funds properly to ensure that we're getting the top priorities to upgrade our infrastructure. And uh, you know, another, you know, out at the pad, we had uh, all that copper wire that ran from launch pad 39A back to the launch control center. That's all fiber optics now. We pulled all that copper out of that tunnel and uh, out of the conduit. We made $620,000 in scrap off the copper that we reinvested back into the project to revitalize the pad. So that, that launch pad is going to be our launch pad for the next 30 years. We're going to launch to Mars from that pad. So we are replacing the infrastructure. That's awesome. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah, I'll say a few words. Um, we have a, and like many of the centers, we, we all have older buildings, but um, we do an analysis um, and it turns out a lot of times you can justify repair by replacement yeah. simply because of the maintenance and operations cost on old buildings um, cost a lot of money. And, and so you have some upfront investment to replace that building, uh, but you make it LEED certified, state of the art power systems and energy efficiency. And, it, and within about five years, a lot of these buildings pay for themselves. Uh, one unique facility we have is, is Mishu, where we build, uh, we built the first stage of the Saturn V, we built the external tanks for shuttle, and now we're building the SLS. That building was actually a, a World War II uh, wooden aircraft facility at the beginning, and uh, it's an old facility, and so um, we, we tend to have a maintenance backlog there, and we, we have to prioritize the work we do. Um, and uh, just a few months ago, we had an F3 tornado uh, literally come right over the middle of the building where, where we that large weld machine you saw there. Uh, and, and the good news is it's pretty well built and none of the hardware was damaged. The bad news is you can see daylight now uh, because of that tornado. So we've got a few unique challenges of our own. Uh, we, we get very creative on how to, how to spend our resources to be able to deliver the kind of work we do. Thank you. Um, let me move on, uh, given our, our time, um, to the astronauts on the panel, Dr. Ochoa, Dr. Cavandi, and Mr. Cabana, how has your experience in LEO made your center role more effective? Who wants to lead with that? Well, at my center, we do both operations and development. And uh, while I certainly don't think it's any kind of requirement that somebody has flown in space to lead the center, um, I, I, th I think it certainly informs the kind of questions that we ask and, 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 and uh, what I do as I lead the center. But uh, we, we've been doing, um, I would say the experience that I had in space on a shuttle mission, it was fantastic. But what people experience now on the International Space Station is completely different. It's kind of the difference between if you travel overseas for two weeks on vacation versus you spend a, a year abroad, you know, living with a family and, and really getting to know the culture. So the people who go on, on the International Space Station now really living and working in space. Um, I know a couple have come back talking about, you know, we're really living on the frontier, trying to understand how you uh, operate in this environment that's so different from what we're used to on Earth, but how you make it a, an actual laboratory and how you use it as a test bed for deep space exploration. So we are trying to take the experience of all those crew members and what we're learning on ISS and really apply it forward to deep space exploration, what we're doing with Orion and our plans going forward. Thank you. Dr. Cavandi? Yes, I think um, having, I spent 20 years at the Johnson Space Center and that camaraderie that you get in the crew office is something that is like no other anywhere else. And we just had an astronaut reunion breakfast this morning and that um, kindred spirit and that uh, those relationships that you build do last a lifetime. So I think uh, going from an operational center to a research facility and the, the research center at Glenn, I wanted to bring some of that, a little bit of the taste of what that camaraderie and that teamwork felt like where I came from and instill some of that at the Glenn Research Center. Um, I have a science background, so I, I speak science, I speak engineering, now I, and speak operations. So I think kind of blending it all together and taking the best of each one of those capabilities and creating the best teams that work best, you know, really well together. And actually, you know, it's a lot more fun when you can work with your friends as well as your you know, fellow scientists and engineers. So bringing that camaraderie and that team spirit uh, to this center has been a real pleasure. Bob? So I think one of the greatest advantages of being an astronaut is, even though I spent 20 years of my NASA career at the Johnson Space Center, as an astronaut, 
I trained at the Marshall Space Flight Center. I was on technical teams up at Marshall. I trained out at Ames. Uh, I spent hours uh, testing hardware down at the Cape, and it gave us a broad base of relationships across all NASA centers, developing those relationships and being able to apply those in a leadership position, I think, is, uh, is critical. I, uh, I, I, it also, it, it, you bring credibility to the job in certain areas, knowing the risks that are taking, knowing the consequences of decisions that uh, can be made on the ground and how they impact the crew. But uh, above everything, I think it's primarily the, the relationships that you develop that allow you to be a more effective leader and to be able to get down and share that with the team. Um, let me um, move on to a couple of other uh, questions. How will the creation of the National Space Council uh, affect you as a center director. So does anyone want to respond to that? Or all of you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I don't know if any of us were in management the last time there was a National yeah. Space Council. I know I wasn't. Uh, what I would just say is NASA has operated effectively with a Space Council, and we've operated, I think, effectively without a Space Council. And, you know, we're going to work together as an overall agency with the leadership at headquarters to understand how we can be most effective in, in working with the Space Council and the people who will be named to it. Anyone say something different? So I'll just say I, I recently read a report by Aerospace where they actually went, and I was like Ellen, I wasn't really familiar with the National Space Council, but they went back and analyzed a few of the Space Councils under different administrations and the pros and cons of various setups. So. As an engineer, I would say it probably depends on how you set it up and who's on it. Um, but as a center director, um, to some extent, um, Robert and Lisa know this, we're shielded from a lot of that. We, we have missions to do, we have hardware to build, and uh, it may affect us, but it'll affect us through orders we get from our bosses, and then we go carry those out. Yep, absolutely. I think the only, only thing I would add to that is I think that the magnitude of the space industry, as we've heard, is quite a bit larger than last time there was a the National Space Council. And I think anything that helps us integrate and reduce duplication and be a little bit more efficient you know, as a, as a nation in terms of how we invest in space and look for synergies between the different ways we can invest, you know, NASA and, 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 and other parts of, of, of the space industry, I think, and, 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 and government investments, I think, you know, can be a good thing. But I think as Todd says, it's, it's really how you do it. And, you know, setting up in an efficient way, I think, is, is critical. Um, one more question from this group, and uh, Crystal, this is for you. I'm sure you'll absolutely appreciate this one, um, given that it's in the press a lot. Um, and it's how will NASA continue Earth climate observation and data collection during the next four years? <laughs> so the, the Earth science portfolio at, N at NASA headquarters is, is a robust program. We're going to continue to do climate observations. That's, that's not something that's going away. At this point in time, we really don't know what the final verdict is going to be. We're still pretty early in this process, and we're not going to really know what the verdict is until the May time frame. So um, NASA headquarters, um, Tom Zerbuchen, who's responsible for the science mission directorate, is going to be taking a look at whatever comes out of that and figuring out exactly what kind of portfolio he needs to go forward with. And, and I'm sure that we will be supporting um, climate, or not climate, global weather um, for some time to come. Uh, I have two questions about academia, and so anyone who would like to respond, please feel free to do so. Uh, they want to know uh, how you will uh, do more and what you will do to work with academia. NASA's roots come from a close relationship with universities, which still exist. However, only Marshall even acknowledged in one sentence only the relationship with universities. Does NASA stand alone, or is it still a partner with university research? Oh, I know that at yeah. Glenn Research Center that we, you know, I've been making an effort to go out and try to visit as many of the universities in the state of Ohio, at least, that I can, and even outside the state of Ohio. We have relationships with some of the, the closer universities, Ohio State University and Case Western University and University of Toledo. So there are many in the area that we do work, work with. We have intern uh, programs for students uh, that come and work, work with us. And then if there are pathways interns, we have uh, 
special hiring abilities where we can take them directly into government positions. Uh, and we work with the researchers there. We, we share some of our facilities uh, with those researchers. We have space, space act agreements that we sign with some of these institutions. So I think we're, along with many of the other centers, very active with, with the local universities. Yeah, I'll well, add on to that also, David. We have multiple partnerships with universities at the Kennedy Space Center with uh, Florida universities in the local area where they actually utilize our facilities and our labs and uh, we support them. So uh, I don't think that's, that's going to change. We're gonna to continue to have those partnerships. One, one thing I might say is JPL is actually run by a university, <laughs> <laughs> run by Caltech since we're an FFRDC. Uh, so we have a pretty, uh, pretty deep relationship, but we also take many other universities very seriously. We have, we have a number of strategic uh, university partnerships that we have identified explicitly and we, we join with them for some of our IRAD investments. Yeah. Um, and we have about a thousand student interns come uh, every summer, and we think that's one of the most valuable programs. I know Ames is not here, but they have a huge program as right. well, and uh, so I, I, it's a critical part of NASA. And and, uh, and of course, we all I think all of us take communication and outreach very seriously as well as part of our mission right. to develop uh, you know the next generation of, of, of STEM folks as well. And the, the only thing that I'll add to that is I mean, for the missions that we're doing in the future, we have to work very closely with the, with academia. And so not just the universities in the United States, but the universities around the world. We have great collaborations with universities all, over, all around the world, and that's gonna continue. And I'll add in addition, we, we have uh, research partnerships and, and of course um, uh, student interns as well that uh, form a, a wonderful part of our workforce. But we also have opportunities to fly experiments in space on the International Space Station. We partner with lots of universities on getting student experiments into space, which I think is very exciting um, for those students and the universities. And we also try to use our facilities. For example, um, we have a program with colleges where students can develop tools to be used on spacewalks, and then they can test them out in our large pool, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, and basically work side by side with astronauts and divers um, in our test facility there to see how their tools work and understand how they might um, continue to develop those. And I, I, I think all of our centers have programs like that as well where we're trying to engage students college level, K through 12, um, really the whole, the whole gamut. I might add that I have the great honor of interviewing lots and lots of academics from all over the world that have something to do with space, including from the social sciences. It's not all science and engineering. And so many of them are doing research projects with people at NASA. Mm -hmm. They're involved with NASA. They seek out NASA. Their relationships are strong. I talk to graduate students all the time on the space show. Many of them um, have jobs and opening jobs and internships with various NASA centers and with researchers. Uh, I can tell you it's an extremely healthy relationship and a very highly sought after objective for academics to be involved with NASA in whatever their research topics are. Uh, I think that is really healthy and very vibrant right now. So I would just add that from an outsider looking in uh, to respond to that question. Um, let's see, to Dr. Ochoa and Dr. Cavandi, uh, I think you did touch on this a little bit, but do any of the centers have any focus on human behavioral research? For example, crew selection, interpersonal engagement, psychological support uh, for Mars deep space travel? Yes, <laughs> uh, we definitely do that at Johnson Space Center, and, and we are the lead for the agency on human health and human performance in space. Um, we host the Human Research Program, HRP, uh, which specifically gets money to do research and development into human performance, and they do it with a variety of ways. Um, they have research grants to universities, um, they use analog environments um, here on Earth, and they also do experiments that are associated with the International Space Station. For example, the studies that were done uh, on the one-year crew were really through a, a, the human research program, including the twin studies that were done on Scott Kelly. Uh, one, just one of the analog environments is we have a sort of a, a habitat structure at Johnson Space Center. Um, and last year, for example, we had um, four different crews of four people each um, spend 30 days in that habitat, and it was really um, kind of a shortened mission to an asteroid. They looked at various different aspects of it, but it was really looking at human performance and how you can 
<laughs> ensure that uh, humans will be able to um, experience both the, the parts of the mission where things are happening fast and the other parts of the mission where you're traveling in space for a while with maybe not as much to do. And this year we're, we're sending people through 45 day missions as well. And by the way, they, they look for people to participate in those missions. So uh, um, they're not necessarily NASA employees that do that. And then before I came to Glenn as a, a director of flight cooperations at Johnson Space Center, then also as deputy director um, of human health and performance while I was at Johnson, uh, we, we did do a lot of the work that Ellen's mentioning. I had the, the honor of being the chair of the selection board, not of the current uh, selection process, but the previous selection proce process. And having been on both sides, you can, you can really uh, learn a lot from, from going through the uh, interview process and then seeing how it's done from the other side. The human behavior aspect is very critical. Uh, we, we always know we're gonna get plenty of people that have very high, high, they're very highly educated. They have very amazing resumes um, and they have a lot of real world experience. Uh, so we know we're gonna get plenty of those. It's how you determine the people you'd really like to live with in a very confined space for a long period of, of time. And uh, fleshing that out is, is something we developed over a long period of time, several years, and the kinds of tests and evaluations that are done now at the Johnson Space Center are those that have resulted from those years of evaluations. Does anyone else want to address that for human behavior? Um, for each of you, what do you see as your center's major contribution to the journey to Mars effort? So <laughs> let's start with Bob this time at the other end. Well, you're not going to get there without a launch pad. <laughs> <laughs> or a place to stack the rocket or a place to get it out to the launch pad. So I think we're pretty well, you know, we've, we've made our input. <laughs> Todd? This is easy. Or a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Uh, That's our contribution. Crystal? I think Goddard's major contribution is technology development for Mars and also the instruments that are going to be necessary. We have to have the instruments to be able to look at the atmosphere, the environment. We have to be able to survey the environment so we know exactly where to land and everything else. But we also have real strength in developing whatever kind of missions are going to be out there for us to do once we get there. So um, we have a significant strength in that area. Thank you. Um, well, so we're already on Mars. Uh, oh, all, of these, all of these guys helped us get there on Mars <laughs> um, uh, and, and operate. But I think the key is, you know, is, is again, it's, it's kind of robotic precursors. How do you learn about Mars? You know, what, what's Mars really like? How do you land on it? How do you operate with long time delays? Um, how do you use robots, you know, in service of, of, of humans? All of this kind of stuff um, is, is, what, is what's critical to, the, to taking the next step. And Mike, I'd like to add the Kennedy Space Center did help you get to Mars. You bet, that's what I said. All of you guys have helped us get there, no question about it, and operate. Well, we talked a little bit about uh, deep space communications. We talked about electric propulsion for uh, sensors and, and spacecraft that go out into deeper space. Uh, but I think one of our bigger contributions at Glenn is the ability to test environmentally before we put those rockets on the pads and, and ship them off um, from Kennedy to, to these deep space locations. Well, really, just about everything we do at Johnson Space Center is with that goal in mind. And we have four priorities that we talk about with our workforce. Maximize use of ISS, and that's important for deep space because in addition to our commercial customers, NASA is a customer and we're using it as a test bed for deep space exploration. Second is enable the success of commercial crew. And as we are able to launch crews from the US, NASA is able to turn more of its attention to deep space. Develop Orion for deep space missions. Obviously, that's a huge focus for us these days. And then build the foundation for human missions to Mars. And that encompasses a lot of the other work that we do, for example, in spacesuits, advanced life support systems, um, and other technology that we need. And the astronauts. And of course, <laughs> select, train, and fly astronauts. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty of probably the last question. Uh, this is for Todd, and it's a really hot topic on the space show, and it has been for years. And uh, maybe you can clarify, because um, I don't know anyone who is in our larger audience who is against nuclear propulsion. So the work that you're doing at Marshall, which was on that slide, right. um, what is its end goal? Is it to actually have an operational nuclear rocket propulsion system that can be used for the missions, or is it an academic or a theoretical goal? 
what, tell us more about that. So I'd say the current scope of the work that we are funded to do is um, simulated reactor testing to understand uh, how you go forward. The ultimate goal of nuclear thermal propulsion is exactly what you said, to have a nuclear thermal propulsion capability um, because from a, a, an efficiency perspective, um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's really, in my opinion, the way to go ultimately. Um, so it, all these kind of things uh, start out as ideas, they start out as technologies, but the ultimate goal is to move those along in development. And, uh, and so I think that, uh, that that is something that's going to be uh, important in the long run, and so it's, it's something that we've been steady at now for a long period of time. Is it an increasing part of Marshall's activity, or is it stagnant? Um, I, I, I don't want to speculate on the, on the future too much um, because, you know, we get um, our appropriations one year at a time uh -huh. um, in this agency, but um, it's something that I would like to see. I, I'd be bullish on it uh, within the constraints of what I'm allowed to be bullish on. Okay. Um, <laughs> and in the, the time remaining, uh, starting with Bob, is there anything you would like to say in conclusion that we have omitted, left out, we should have ask you a question. This is I your think chance. we've said it all. This is an extremely exciting time for spaceflight. Uh, things are changing extremely fast, but our future is absolutely awesome. Uh, we have a clear path forward and uh, we're executing it. And I, I, I cannot imagine being part of this team right now at this time in our history. It's, it's just a great time. Todd, any closing for you? Uh, nothing. I, I echo what Bob says. Uh, sometimes I pinch myself that we get to get up every day and be part of this uh, agency at this time. It's, it's a very exciting time uh, with all the commercial and new space developments. It's an exciting time to be uh, building the rocket and the Orion uh, hardware. It's an exciting time to see what's happening at Mars and to have the prospect of Europa. Uh, it's an exciting time to see that a year from now uh, we will see James Webb launch and, and uh, really truly unlock uh, more mysteries of, of the universe. So That's I'm just happy to be here. Crystal, any comments from you? Yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited about the future as it pertains to, to the science portfolio. The kinds of questions that we're going to be able to answer and the kinds of things we're going to be able to unlock for our future are going to be amazing. And I'm really happy to be kind of helping to architect that for Goddard in the future. It's very exciting. Mike? Uh, yeah, what, what they said. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think one thing to remember is you know, we always think the past, there was golden ages in the past, and I think we're really actually you know, entering a new one here. There's just fantastic stuff going on. And I also think the linkages between, between us, for example, the fact that Europa and outer planets need an SLS to get there you know, within reasonable amounts of time, I think the linkages between us and the agency is something that we all look forward to working with. And you know, the, the notion that, that the robotic precursors can lead to, to human and how to exchange that information better. Um, I think it's a great team to be a part of, uh, and it's, uh, it's a great time. Janet and Ellen, your comments, please. Real quickly, NASA was voted the best place to work in the federal government for like six years in a row. So you can tell that the enthusiasm is, is uh, contagious and that everyone that works here, I think, really has passion for it and we believe in what we're doing. And Ellen? I'll just say we always keep in mind we have people in space every single minute of every day, and we have had for more than 16 and a half years now. And uh, so we take that responsibility very seriously. But more important, when you think back 20 years, we, uh, before we'd ever launched the first module of the space station, we had this vision of working with international partners, of working with companies, of doing all kinds of different science in space. And, and we realized that vision, and it's really exciting. Thank you to our panel and to all of you who listened and participated. It's yeah. been an honor for me to be the moderator. And I appreciate the Space Foundation for making all of this possible for all of us up here and all of you in the room. Thank you, and goodbye, everyone. Have a great rest of the symposium.